Um, just a reminder that 3C Run is a partnership between San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. We are ratepayer funded, uh, and our job is to return that utility bill funding from ratepayers back to our communities to improve workforce um, around energy efficiency. Next slide. So we have three programs. Um, we went over this last class, so I'll just go with them briefly on this slide. Uh, today, the program is being brought to you by Energy Code Connect, which um, is our program that serves building officials and code officials. Um, we offer trainings and regional forums, as well as HERS Rater and CEA um, training support and sponsorship. Our building performance training program is for new and existing building professionals to uh, build upon their technical and soft skills. And our home energy savings program is for residents who are looking to upgrade their home. We offer rebates through contractors for single family, uh, and then we work with property managers and owners in the multifamily space. Uh, and then you can skip ahead to your intro slides. So thank you all so much for joining. Um, I'm going to put the a copy of the slides in the chat just one more time and take it away, Russ. Awesome. Thanks, Gray. All right, welcome back, everyone. I'm I'm going to assume everyone was here on Tuesday. Um, if not, you'll be able to to watch that um, class. Um, it's recorded and the, it'll be posted, and everyone will get an email when it gets posted. Uh, but welcome back for the rest of you. Um, so today we're going to cover uh, Manual D. And again, this class was originally developed for Sonoma County's Energy and Sustainability Program. Uh, they're pushing a lot of heat pumps over there and being very successful at it. And in order to prevent um, a lot of uh, you know, dissatisfied customers, um, it's they realize the importance of making sure heat pumps are properly designed. As I mentioned last week, all the problems that you hear about heat pumps, all the, the bad reputation they may have, um, are from design problems. It's not the equipment that's causing the problems, it's how it was designed. And it's usually related to the sizing of the equipment to the loads of the house, but also a very important aspect of that is how well designed the duct systems are. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. <clears throat> so on um, was that, Tuesday, <laughs> on Tuesday we covered the ACCA Air Conditioning Contractors of America, Manual J, Load Calculations and Manual S equip Equipment Selection, and then the third part of that, uh, in part two of the training, is ACA Manual D, okay? So today we're going to go do a little bit of review over what we talked about last week, and then we'll talk again about the, um, the, the overall design process. Remember, there's four steps to it, um, and then we'll go into the details of Manual D. So again, I'm still licensed in three states. Um, all the rest is still true. Uh, you've got copies of these slides, so uh, you should have all my contact information. Um, there's my email. Feel free to email me if you have any questions about what we talk about today. Um, and um, there's several times I mention my blog because in my blog, I, I kind of go into a lot of detail about things. Like, for example, today we'll talk about friction rate and how friction rate is used to size ducts. I have a long blog article on friction rate, and so I kind of use my my blog is as places to send people for more information about particular topics when I don't really have time to cover it in a lot of detail in a class. Okay. And um, again, so ACA is Air Conditioning Contractors of America. Uh, they're the largest HVAC trade association in the United States. If you are um, an HVAC contractor, I, I encourage you to look into them. I know they provide a lot of really interesting services um, for contractors. They have a big trade show every year. Um, they're sort of the national version of what IHACI is uh, to, to the West Coast. Um, and um, um, they, they have lots of great training and stuff like that. So I encourage you to look into that. All of their manuals are ANSI approved, which is actually very important. It means that it goes through a very rigorous um, public review and approval process. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. Again, the three basic manuals that you hear about all the time that are actually referenced in code our Manual J, Manual S, and Manual D. Um, they have a lot of other manuals too. They even have some, some non-residential commercial uh, manuals for designing commercial uh, um, systems. Um, but the ones that um, I, I use a lot are Manual RS, is kind of an overview of the design system. Manual T is for terminal selections. That's probably the fourth most important one. 
um, it's how to pick registers and it talks about you know how to how to read the manufacturer manufacturer specs for a supply register for um, uh, determining airflow static pressure drop throw distance noise criteria and stuff like that and then where to put them in a room um, to to make sure that they're not blowing on people and and to ensure good <clears throat> mixing and you'll hear me you'll hear me say mixing a lot to me that's the most important thing because the sooner you get that air coming out of the register at a very different temperature than the room air as soon as you get it to mix with the room air the sooner you solve a lot of problems and problems like stratification and drafts on people and stuff like that and so i'm a huge proponent of mixing um i don't know if i mentioned uh previously um uh, i've been doing mechanical design for 30 years and in those 30 years i ran uh, two different mechanical engineering departments that specialized in production homes and during those years, I probably did around 3,000 houses, two to 3,000 houses easy. Um, and um, they were all master plans, which means those designs that I did were built many, many times each. So there was a lot of houses out there that I designed, um, mostly California. About a third of my work was in Las Vegas. And uh, we did a lot of ho homes in Las Vegas. Um, and I like I, I, I like to be able to say that I had no real complaints on any of the designs I did. A, if they followed my plans reasonably well, I wasn't super picky about it. Um, they didn't have to put the ducts in exact or the registers in exactly the same place, but I was very picky about duct sizes. I didn't want them to mess with the duct sizes and the equipment size. If they had the right duct sizes and the right equipment sizes, I, I considered they, that they followed my plans. And, and every time they followed my plans, I had no complaints. So, and I never worried too much about a couple of things that you'll hear people talk about. I never worried much about velocity of, of air inside the ducts. Now, face velocity is different. That's why I'm mentioning it now because face velocity coming out of the registers, that is important because that's how you get your throw. Um, but anyways, um, there's a lot of stuff that over the years I started, you know, when I was first learning to do design, people were telling me to spend a lot of time worrying about this and spend a lot of time worrying about that. And I found, over time, if you do a good design with proper airflow, okay, good overall airflow, and to me, um, the mechanical code, or sorry, the energy code requires at least 350 CFM per ton, okay? And I, I'm sorry, I'm getting away from my slide, uh, but at least 350 CFM per ton is minimum in California. So I consider that a D minus. 349 CFM per ton, that's an F, you fail. If a HERS rater tests your system and you get 349 CFM, that's a fail. You have to fix it. I consider a 400 CFM per ton as a C, as a C grade. 500, 600 CFM per ton, those are, those are better, much better, okay? But that's because we're in a dry climate. If we were in a humid climate, um, higher CFMs don't remove as much air. Um, so anyways, if you have good airflow, and by good, I mean at least 400 to, four, 400 to 500 CFM per ton, and your equipment is not way oversized, it hides a lot of problems with where you put a register, what kind of register you put in, do you have a return in the hallway, do you have an upstairs return, downstairs return, all those things become very, very secondary uh, to your design if you have those most important things, which is good airflow and good sizing of the equipment relative to the, equip, uh, to the, to the load. And, and not having short cycling. Short cycling will cause a lot of other problems become apparent, okay? So just keep that in mind as we go through this stuff. Um, since the temperature of the entire house uh, is, is being sensed by usually one location, you can have, you, can have, you know, uh, remote thermostat sensors and stuff like that, but 99% of the homes or 95% of the homes only have one thermostat per system, okay? Uh, you can have zonal control in two, but still the point is the same. You're sensing a bunch of room temperatures at one location. And in order for that location to do a good job, you need the air to go to each room proportional to that room's load. Because if you're putting too much air in one room and not enough air in the other, this the thermostat has no way of, of knowing that, okay? So it's all about putting the right air in the right rooms at the right rate. Okay, so that's why duct sizing and what we call balance, air balance, that's what air balance is all about. It's making sure each room gets the right amount of air proportional to that room's load. And you can have giant rooms with small loads and you can have tiny rooms with huge loads. 
So it has nothing to do with square footage. It's more about glass and glass orientation than it is about square footage, okay? Uh, you, can have, you can have rooms in a house that have zero load. That's, if you have a two-story slab on grade house and you got a little powder room in the middle of the house that's completely surrounded by conditioned space and you do a load calc on that room, it'll say zero load. This room needs zero air. OK, um, I, I tell all kinds of stories about that, but we don't really have time today. All right. So um, let's see. We need the proper airflow to each room. Uh, some rooms might need more than one register. If you need a lot of air to one room and it needs, you know, like a huge duct for all that air, you might want to consider splitting it into two. And that's fine, too. The point is, is just you're getting the right amount of air to that room relative to its load. In order to know how much air is going to each room, you have to do, excuse me, room by room load calculations, okay? If you only have a block load, you're just guessing where air is gonna go. And I see that all the time. I look at plans, actually CAD drawn plans that show the airflow to each room is like 150, 150, 200, 50, 100, 150. It's all in increments of 50 CFMs. I can tell right away, they did not do a load count because that is not, they're just guessing. They're just saying how much air needs to go to each room based on the size of the room. And you'll see two identical rooms in two parts of the house with the exact same CFM going to those rooms. I know they didn't do a load a room by room load calculation because one room um, has windows on two sides and one room has windows on one side and it's got rooms on both sides. I know that other room needs a lot less air. And the only way to know that is through room by room load calculations. And then when you undersize all the ducts, you know, or, or just the return so that you're reducing that four to 500 CFM per ton, you're getting it down close to the 350, you start losing cooling capacity. You're making your equipment work harder for heat pumps and air conditioners to heat and cool the house, um, and you're making them less efficient. So their sear rating is less. Their HSPF is less if you have less airflow across the coil, okay? So it's just that much more important that you do good duct sizing, okay? Undersizing one or two ducts in, in the house relative to each other will give you poor air balance. This will result in uneven temperatures and some rooms warmer and some co rooms cooler, okay? Um, these problems are made more noticeable when your overall airflow goes down. That's when you start seeing those problems pick up, okay? I've done a lot of, you know, you know made a lot of recommendations to fix problem houses where they were having uneven temperatures around the house. And um, occasionally I had it where all we had to do was increase the return capacity. We didn't change the balance of the house. We just reduced the return capacity and it made so much air pass through the house that the house got better mixing. And even though there was some imbalances in the house, it was hidden by that really good airflow. Okay, so, so remember that. That'll make things work a lot better. All right. So equipment cannot be properly sized unless you determine the capacity of the equipment at design conditions. So that was manual S. And, and so, you know, a, a three ton air conditioner in San Luis Obispo will give you a lot more cooling than that exact same system in Las Vegas, for example, because the outdoor temperatures are so different. So you need to be able to determine what is the design capacity at those locations. And then you need to match that to the load. OK, so it's all about uh, balancing equipment to the load, equipment capacity. And again, in order to distribute the air, you need room by room load calculations. And then we talked about the, the basic overall process for designing a system. So remember, collect information about the house. That's getting a set of plans or creating a set of plans. And by the way, I, I mentioned QB cost, so be sure to check that out. It's free. Try it out on your house. I was astounded. I, I went through my house, and, and I was intentionally sloppy when I went through my house, and I sent it off, and it came back. I, and I was, I was like, oh, my gosh, somebody snuck into my house and measured it because the design was, the layout was, was dead on. I mean, I can, I can show you here. This is, there's, there's my house, okay? And uh, it, it looked, I can't find anything wrong with it. I mean, it looks just, it looks exactly like the actual house. So, anyways. Um, check it out. Um, so collect information about the house and then you need information about, you know, the kind of walls, how much ceiling insulation. And remember we talked about one of the big things is infiltration. What I do on an existing house, if I can't actually get a hold of the blower door test on a house and see how leaky the house is, I will do the load calcs at leaky 
average, and tight. I will do the load counts, three different load counts for leaky, average, and tight, and I will compare them. And what you will sometimes find is that the average and tight will result in the same size equipment, and then the leaky will result in the next size up. Okay, and then I will say, okay, I'm gonna do it for average because if the house is leaky, all you have to do is seal the house up and you can go to the next size piece of equipment. So that's very useful information to do that kind of comparison load calculations. All right, so once you do that, you do your load calculations, room by room load calculations, that's manual J, we talked about that. Then you select your equipment according to manual S. And manual S is actually being rewritten right now um, and they're, the new version that's going to be out by the end of the year um, is um, going to focus a lot more on heat pump sizing. Okay, There's a lot more uh, has been learned, and, I'll, and it's a lot more important now because heat pumps are so much more common. <clears throat> um, as far as oversizing the heat pump, oversizing the heating, uh, or sizing the heating to the heat load, and making sure you don't oversize the cooling, and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So it's very important to, um, to follow manual S. So manual S, uh, if manual S is being required by a building department, if they say, and, it, and, and this is in the mechanical code, okay, but it's, it's not as enforced as it should be, but it's getting, it's getting better. More and more building departments are asking for it. So they'll say, we want to see your manual J, manual S, and manual D load calculations. And if they're going to check it, what that means is you cannot oversize your equipment. There are undersizing and oversizing percentages, depending on whether it's single speed, uh, two speed and variable speed equipment. So they want you to, to fall within those ranges, okay? And there's special reports that have to get printed out. But manual S also goes into a lot of detail about how to read the OEM expanded data tables to make sure you can determine that design capacity, okay? <clears throat> now, um, so we hit all that in the last class. Now we're gonna talk about manual D, which is personally my favorite part. I, I enjoy uh, duct designs. Uh, like I said, all those designs I did um, were for master plans. They were for production homes. And so we had to design these houses um, to, so that they could be built in any orientation. Um, you, you know, you're, you're doing one design that's going to be built in any orientation. It has to work in all those orientations. And so we would design it in such a way that the ducts um, went out. I called them quadrants of the house. So I divided the house into two or six parts so that when the house turns, um, it has basically the same impact on the loads. And so I'd put manual balancing dampers and stuff like that. And again, if you do a good design, you don't have to adjust those balancing dampers. Um, I finally had contractors, I went out to, to, you know, they started a new phase and I went out and I looked at, to see if they were following the plans. I go up there, I go, hey, you guys aren't putting in balancing dampers anymore. And he goes, he goes, we never use them. We installed them and we never used them. We never had to adjust the balance snappers. The homeowners were, were perfectly happy uh, just with good overall airflow throughout the house. And that's, that's generally true. So there you go. All right, so manual D is what we're gonna talk about today. So this is one of the most overlooked aspects of HVAC design and one of the biggest sources of comfort problems. After equipment sizing, the next most common problem is bad duct design, okay? And it's usually they're just, the entire system is undersized and it's pinching off the airflow and it's causing all those other problems to pop up, okay? And then the next thing is, is balance between rooms. Uh, sizing the ducts is also one of the easiest parts of the manual D process. It is not rocket science. It, um, even though HVAC is referred to sometimes as the other rocket science, um, it's, it's not that complicated. It's not brain surgery, let's put it that way. All right, so the, making the ducts fit in the house is the only hard part. Uh, sizing the ducts is super easy. I mean, it, it's literally, it's really easy. Sizing the ducts is a breeze. Getting them to fit in the house is really, really tough. I, over my career, I found some really creative ways to get ducts from the upstairs attic down to the first floor um, and um, had, to, had to fight for that space a lot. You know, I would, I would, I would spec a, um, a 12 by 12 uh, clear chase. You know, I'd box out a corner of a closet and then I'd get out to the project or they'd call me up and say, hey, Russ, there's a problem. I'd get out there and there's a floor joist going right through the middle of that 12 by 12 chase, which I was hoping to get a 10 inch duct to go down through there. Um, so that's always the hardest part is, is figuring that stuff out. So uh, if you're gonna start doing a lot of uh, design, especially on multi-story houses, learn to read structural plans. Learn to read structural plans. It's very, very tricky to get the ducts to fit in that house. Get to know the structural engineer. 
get to know the framer, get to know the general contractor, get out there early and say, hey, don't, don't put a floor joist right in the middle of this, this chase. Don't put a beam right where I need to go. Don't, don't wait to get out there to install it before, before claiming your space, okay? Don't let the plumber take up some of your floor joists or the electrician and stuff like that. I can't tell you some of the crazy stuff I saw. Um, just one I, I did see, I think this was in a, a big subdivision in Calabasas, Southern California. Um, I, I saw this, this big duct going down a floor joist, between the floor joists, and I saw a, a Rumex going through it. I was like, that looks like it's going through the actual duct. And sure enough, the electrician cut the Romex to a point and poked it through the flex duct and pulled it out the other side. So it actually poked a hole through the flex duct going through the floor joist. So anyways, different, different issue, but, uh, but uh, that's the kind of stuff you have to deal with. That's the hard part of, of designing uh, HVAC systems in a house is getting them to fit in a house and fighting for your, for your space. But as long as you have room by room low calculations, the actual sizing of the ducts is quite easy, okay? So let's look at an example house, all right? And by the way, all these screenshots you see are, are from uh, the software called Quick Model 3D, Quick Model with Energy Gauge Loads. Um, and so here's a house, it's a 1,750 foot um, single story ranch style home. You can see it's got a couple of vaulted ceilings. This is the master suite back here. Uh, this is the living room, kitchen, kitchen space here. Couple bedrooms, bathroom, uh, dining room, utility room, and some a uh, bathroom. And then the blue one over here is a garage. Blue means it's not conditioned. Okay. Typical flex duct system. Uh, this is how I like to design houses. This this is how I would design it if it was a production home. And you'll see I've got one. I've got four trunks. So I divided this house into four quadrants. Um, I've got one serving the master suite. I always like to give the master suite its own trunk uh, so that you can adjust it. Um, I've got these two bedrooms and a bathroom up front are on a trunk. I've got these rooms here that wrap around the front are on their own trunk. And then I got this big um, living kitchen space on its own trunk. And the reason I do that is because as the house rotates, the loads are going to go up or down depending on the direction they're facing. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect certain rooms in the same way. So these two rooms up here are, are going to go up or down basically in the same amount. So by putting one trunk on there that I can adjust, it makes it easier to do that. Um, some people like to do, and there's literally a thousand different ways to run the same air to the same house, okay? You don't have to do it the way I'm showing you. Um, some people like what we call the home run system or the octopus. And that is you just have one run coming off the supply plenum and going to each register, just boom, straight shots to each register. That works great too. That's fine too. It's, it's all about optimizing the, the, the cost of materials um, and, and maintaining a good, uh, good airflow, okay? And if you follow manual D, there's literally a thousand different ways um, to, to do the same thing, to accomplish the same thing, which is getting the right amount of air to each room. I used to tell contractors, I, you know, I would go out to a house, we actually had people who would go out and measure airflow at each register. Um, that was required in Las Vegas, actually. So, I would, they would send me back the air balance reports. And as long as it looked good, I honestly, I didn't care what was going on in the attic. They could tie the ducts in knots. They could run certain loop-de-loops all over the place. And as long as the right amount of air was coming out of the register, that's, that's what I knew. Now, I, I did, I, I'm being a little bit sarcastic when I say that because the more ducts you have, the more heat transfer you'll have, okay? So there is an energy penalty by having too much ductwork in the attic. Um, but generally speaking, as long as the right amount of air was coming out, I didn't care if they, like if right here, they ran this duct, you know, straight off the supply uh, plenum or something like that. I didn't care if they tweaked these little red, you know, move these um, TYs around or anything like that. I didn't really care. I didn't even care if they moved the registers around that much. As long as the right amount of air was coming out, I was pretty much happy at that point. And then if problems popped up, which no serious problems ever did, um, occasionally we'd have something like, Oh, they this family has a uh, has a bunk bed that they want to put directly under a register. Well, we had no idea that that was going to happen. You know, we you know we had we did the best we could uh, to build to design houses for you know hundreds of different families. So, anyways, really basic, simple design. Okay, um, like I said, I deal with contractors all over the country. 
I have contractors who absolutely will not install FlexDuct no matter how much you pay them. <laughs> they absolutely think FlexDuct is evil. I, I don't understand that. I mean, I understand it. I totally disagree with it. Um, I, I, I've, like I said, I've designed thousands of houses, each built multiple times, and they all test out great. FlexDuct lasts a long time. It is more susceptible to bad installation. It can be kinked, it can be crimped, okay? But I think it's a lot cheaper, it's a lot easier to install, and if it's, if it's designed correctly, it'll work fine. And you know, everyone says, oh, well, sheet metal, sheet metal flows better than FlexDuct. It's only one size difference. So a six inch sheet metal will give you the same amount of air as a seven inch flex. That's not that big of a difference. That's not a, and that seven inch flex is gonna be cheaper than the sheet metal, okay? So um, so I don't buy a lot of those arguments. Um, it is allowed by code. It is 100% allowed by code. Um, and so, uh, and I think it, it's in some cases, it's a lot easier to balance a flex tech system depending on how you lay it out. So anyways, all right. So um, this layout here that we're looking at is what we call a horizontal unit in an attic. Very, very common California ranch style homes. So you basically have a unit, you've got a return in the ceiling, You've got supplies in the ceiling. The, the furnace is going to rest up on a platform like this. Very, very common, especially new construction in California. But there's a lot of different ways to do it. So here's our horizontal in an attic. You can have a rooftop package unit. You'll see a lot of those. You can have a downflow unit with all the ducts in a crawl space. So you need a raised floor to do this. And have floor registers. That's what's in my house right now. I have a downflow unit with floor registers in it. Um, you can have an upflow unit in the hall closet with a low return and then all ceiling registers, also very common, okay? So lots of different ways to do it. Which one is better than the others? Honestly, depends on how much space you have and, and the ability to install this, the equipment and install the ducts. Um, you know, floor registers are actually a little better for cooling than they are for heating. And a lot of people say, well, that doesn't make sense because hot air rises. Or remember what I said about mixing. So my general rule of thumb is that you wanna blow the air the opposite direction that it wants to go. So if air is naturally going to fall, you want to blow it up. If air is naturally going to rise, you want to blow it down. Okay. So anyways, um, I, I actually have a blog article about that if you're curious why I say that. Um, so one of these you're going to have to pick, and it's going to be ease of installation and the ability to run your ducts. Now, the, it's really easy in a one-story house, whether it's an attic or a crawl space. Uh, two-story houses can be a real challenge. If you can do two systems, that's a possibility too. That's you, you know, if if one system will handle the load of a two-story house, you can make it work just fine. But sometimes you have a big house and you may want to have two separate systems. That's fine too. I am not a big fan of zonal control systems, the motorized dampers. They they they're usually designed poorly. Um, the bypass damper usually causes issues. Um, they usually fail early and stuff like that. So if, if I was building my own house and I had a choice between zonal control dampers or two systems, I would definitely go two systems. Um, but anyways, um, it, and it would definitely cost more too. Um, so if you have two systems, you could do something like this. If this was a raised floor house, you could have um, the first floor being uh, in the crawl space and be a downflow. But most of the designs I did for two-story houses were a single system serving two floors. And a lot of people will say, oh, you, that's not going to work. Uh, you've got to have zonal control. You've got to have a, a return on the first floor. I disagree. I and I have hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of designs and occupied homes to prove that you can do it and it'll work fine. How does it work fine? Proper equipment sizing, proper duct sizing. Most homes with a single system serving two stories that are having issues, upstairs, downstairs, those problems are caused probably by oversized equipment that's short cycling or by bad duct design, probably a combination of both of those, okay? So trust me, if you can do good equipment sizing, you gotta do good low calcs, gotta do manual S and do good duct design, manual D, you can put a single system in a two-story house with one thermostat and it'll work fine, summer and winter, okay? is you've got to have that good airflow and you've got to have good duct sizing for that to be true. All right. Um, so let's just get some terminology out of the way. Um, I think in California, we mostly use the same terminology and I, but I've noticed in other parts of the country, 
Um, they call things different, different names. Um, like I ran into a guy from, I don't know where he was from, Arkansas or something. He had never heard the term TY before. He was, what's a TY? I, I forget what they call them, but um, a splitter. I think he called them a splitter or something like that. Um, so let's just kind of run through some terminology. So supplied plenum, when I say supplied plenum, I'm talking about this box on the end of the air handler that the ducts are connected to, okay? It's basically a, a, a rectangular box that allows you to connect round ducts to the end of a, of a system. Um, the return plenum is the same thing on the other end. You don't always need a return plenum. If you have more than one return duct, you probably want a return plenum. If you only have one return duct, um, you can just attach that straight to the bottom of the furnace or the air handler, okay? Air handler. A lot of people think air handler means fan coil unit. It doesn't. Air handler is the box with the fan in it that's pushing the air through the ducts. An air handler can be either a furnace or a fan coil unit for heat pumps, okay? So when I say air handler, I, it's, I'm, it's either a furnace or a fan coil unit. It's the box that moves the air through the duct system, okay? If it's a furnace, it's going to have a coil on it, okay, um, an, an air conditioning coil. If it's a fan coil unit, this blue and red are all a single box, okay. It's an all-in-one sort of thing. And here's a here's a cutaway of a, of a coil. Um, this would be an upflow A coil, all right. A lot of different coils. There's U coils and W coils and slab coils and all this other stuff. But uh, for a furnace, it's a separate box that's attached to the end. So this red would be the furnace and this blue would be the coil box and then supply plenum and return plenum. Uh, supply registers, some people call them vents, um, terminals, registers, whatever you wanna call them. I'm gonna call them supply registers. There's a lot of different kinds of supply registers. There's stamp face, there's bar type, there's two way, three way, four way, one way, okay? They're usually attached to the, to the ceiling or floor by a register boot. That's a little box that allows you to connect the round duct to it, okay? Pretty common. TY is a sheet metal uh, fitting that allows you to take one large uh, flex duct and make, turn it in, split it into two smaller, two small ones. I guess that's why they call, I call them splitters. Um, usually the way they're built is one of the runs is gonna go straight through like this here and one's gonna come off at an angle, okay? That's important later on, we start talking about static uh, equivalent lengths and resistance to airflow, all right? So usually one goes straight. They do make TYs that have equal splits. They, some people call those pair of pants. So that's a funny term for, to me, but pair of pants wise. You can also have the um, um, duckboard triangle boxes, the cheese wedges, okay? And you can have multiple ones come off of those, all right? Uh, return grill. Most of California uh, and Las Vegas, most almost all the designs I did, uh, we used filter grills. So the filter was at the grill. Um, a lot of other outside California, other states back east, uh, the filter goes in a in a slot right at the bottom of the air handler, right in the return plenum, basically. Um, I'm not a big fan of that because then you don't have as much. You can't put as big of a filter in there. You have to have weird transitions and stuff like that. So we're pretty much going to focus on return grills that have a filter in them, filter grill, okay? A supply branch is the duct that goes out to the supply register. That's the last run. Some people call that the, well, I forget what they call it, the home run or the, the final run or something like that, but we're going to call it the branch. It's the, it's the last run, okay, that, go, that connects to the supply register. And then a trunk, using the tree analogy, br trunks and branches, uh, a trunk is any duct that splits into more than one duct, okay? If a duct has air going through it and that air is gonna go to more than one register, we call that a trunk, okay? So you can have a trunk that serves two branches like right here, or you can have a trunk that serves another trunk and a branch, or you can have a trunk that serves two trunks, which then serve multiple branches and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, so we got supply trunks and, oops, I, sorry, return branch, I missed the sites. Return branch uh, is the return duct that goes to the register. Um, a lot of houses only have one return branch. Um, I usually put two. I like to put one in the, in the master suite. Um, and we can talk about that later. But um, uh, if you have multiple ones, I, I, was, I was basically forced <laughs> to design 
um, some houses for a builder from back east, uh, moved out to Las Vegas and wanted to build a subdivision in Las Vegas. And he was from back east and he insisted that every bedroom have a return duct, a return grill in every bedroom. And in some of the other, any room that had a, had a closable door basically, except bathrooms. Um, and so the supply layout and the return layout were almost mirror images of each other. And it was an absolute nightmare to balance that system. It was horrible. I do not recommend that. I do not recommend that at all. Not only is it way more expensive, it's unnecessary in terms of performance. Um, and um, so anyways, I, I won't get on that soapbox, but um, you can have that. And, and so you'd call those return branches and return trunks, supplied branches and supply trunks. Okay. So again, software is, is super important if you're gonna do this. Um, there's three, last time I checked, if you go to the ACCA website and you search for approved software, um, there's three that are certified for Manual J, Manual S, and Manual B, okay? And they're right soft, there's Elite, and then the other one you'll see is called Energy Gauge. That's all it says is Energy Gauge. Energy Gauge is the load calculation engine for a quick model with Energy Gauge loads, okay? So these are the three um, main ones. All the screenshots you're going to see in this in these PowerPoint presentations are screenshots of this, okay, of this house right here. Um, whichever one you choose, and I honestly don't care which one you choose, I, I tr I've trained on all three of these, uh, whichever one you choose or, or already have, um, learn it, understand your software, know what it's doing, uh, take some classes specifically on that software. I know that pg e has um, some pretty extensive training that Gary Wollen does, for WriteSoft, um, I do lots of training on Quick Model. I used to do all the training on, on WriteSoft. Um, I don't know anybody off the top of my head that's doing elite training at the moment, but I'm sure there's people out there. Uh, but I know there's a lot of free training on WriteSoft and Energy Gauge or Quick Model. Um, WriteSoft is, if I had to guess, of all the HVAC contractors and engineers doing residential HVAC design, I would say 85 to 90% of them use WriteSoft. So that is by far the most popular one out there, but it's also the oldest one. It's been around forever. Um, Quick Model is the newest one, and then Elite is all somewhere in the middle. All right. Okay. So to perform the load calcs, it is recommended that you take a class on how to use that software. So specific to the software, because they're all going to behave a little bit differently, but they're all going to be doing basically the same thing in the background. I have compared results from different software done on the same house. And as long as you're putting the same inputs in, you're gonna get the same results out, okay? Whenever I see big differences, like somebody did a design on a house using this and someone did a design on a house using that, and they're saying this needs to be a three ton and they're saying it needs to be a four ton, that's usually because they put different inputs into the software and they got different outputs out. And then one of them did a better job with manual S and then the other one. So it's not the software that's causing those issues, it's the user, okay? All right, so this is a screen snip of a table out of um, Quick Model. Um, all the other two software programs will have something similar to this. And this is an example of what you might see in the software after you do your room by room load calculations. So we've built the, um, we've, we've, we've built the um, house, we did the load calculations on a room by room basis, and this is sort of the results, okay? So here's all the rooms, master bedroom, master bath, bath two, bed three, bed two, living room, kitchen, dining room, powder, and utility room. It says what floor they're on. Um, it says what floor they're on and some other information about systems. So if this house had more than one system, uh, some rooms would be assigned to block one and some would be assigned to block two and so on and so forth. You can rename these. Um, if there were three systems in this house, when you click on this little down arrow here, each of those three systems show up and you select the one that applies to that room, okay? Uh, if there's multiple zones, it's got the floor area for each room, it's got the volume, it's got the room type. Manual J needs to know how many bedrooms and Manual J needs to know which room is the kitchen because the kitchen has extra load in it because of the stove and the refrigerator and appliances and stuff like that. Then you have to distribute people, okay? Oops, the general rule of thumb, is number of bedrooms plus one. Number of bedrooms plus one. If you don't know any better, number of bedrooms plus one. Um, if, um, um, 
if you do know how many people are going to live in, if it's a custom house and you know the family that's going to move into that house, then you can use different numbers. But if you don't know any better, um, or even if you know there's only be two people living in the house, go ahead and put four people in there because some of them, you know, four may, may come later on. So number of bedrooms plus one. And then the question is, where do you put them? Again, the general rule of thumb is um, where are they going to be during the hottest time of the day? So I just figure, you know, there'll be, you know, a couple of kids in each of the bedrooms and then, you know, a couple of people in the living room kitchen area. Okay. I could have put them all in the living room. Um, doesn't really matter. Not a big deal. It'll, it'll change the load of the room a little bit. Then we got our heating load and CFM information. Now the CFM came from the manual S equipment selection process. So we picked a piece, we did our load cast, we picked a piece of equipment. Once we know that equipment, we can tell the software how many CFM it's gonna move at which static pressure. Okay, we'll get to that in a little bit. And that's what appear here. So we have a heating CFM and we have some cooling information. We have a cooling CFM. And then um, as I, I think I mentioned this uh, last week that um, maybe um, heating CFM and cooling CFM going to the same room. Occasionally, occasionally you'll have more heating CFM than cooling CFM. So the actual size of the duct is the higher of those two numbers. And you can look down here and you say cooling CFM is a thousand, heating CFM is 850. So if, if cooling CFM was the highest CFM in all cases, this would add up to a thousand, but it doesn't. It adds up to 1,045. So there's a couple rooms it looks like. Uh, this room here is using 51 because heating is 51 and cooling is 38. So it's gonna use the higher of those two. So basically the software does this automatically. It just looks at the heating CFM and cooling CFM and it picks the higher of the two and it puts it in this column. And that's what we're gonna size the ducts to because we wanna make sure the higher of those two goes there. And then people say, well, then don't you have to open and close dampers in the summer and winter time because it's different CFM? Probably not, probably not. You know, a homeowner is definitely not gonna know the difference between 38 and 51 CFM. There is no homeowner on this planet that's gonna say, oh, I think that CFM should be 38, not 51. Um, I can't even tell that when I go out to a house. So that's not gonna make a difference. This one, 51 versus 83, that's a pretty big difference in terms of percent. But in terms of comfort, it's not that big of a difference. And look, it's just a powder room. Um, so probably not, probably not. And remember I said that good equipment sizing and good overall airflow is gonna hide problems like this. I guarantee you that that's gonna be hidden. You, you will not have to open and close a damper in the powder room for summer and winter airflows, okay? Um, very, very occasionally, once in a great, great while, I'll get a, an important room, like a bedroom, where it'll have a pretty substantial difference between heating and cooling airflows. Uh, and I get a little worried about that, but I have, I have yet to have it ever be a big deal, okay? Uh, if you put the balance of damage to be somewhere in the middle between the two airflows, it's usually just fine. Okay, uh, and so higher of the two in the last column. That's what we use to size the ducts. Now let's zoom in. So we got this big table here. We're gonna look at the room names and we're gonna look at the cool heating information. Then we're gonna look at the cooling information. So here is the cooling information. This is the total cooling load, okay? Now that's a little different than what you see in manual J. Manual J is gonna give you the total cooling load for all the rooms, plus infiltration, plus duct leakage, plus um, what else? Occupants, internal gains. It's gonna give you a bunch of stuff not directly associated with rooms. This load is just the rooms. That's what you need for, for distributing the air, okay? Because it's all about percentages. The actual load that you're gonna see in manual J and the actual load that was used to size the equipment is actually gonna be a little bit higher than that 20,289 that you see right there because it's gonna have infiltration on top. Oh, ventilation is the other one. Um, occupants, occupants, those go in the room. Uh, appliances go in the rooms. There's other loads that apply to the entire house. And then those get distributed to the rooms proportional. And if you did that, it would not change the percentages because it's all about percentage of total, okay? So just, I just want to explain that. Um, <clears throat> but what's important here is that this room is a certain percent of that, this room is a certain percent of that, and this room, and so on. And that's this cooling fraction right here, okay? 
oops, sorry, I missed the slide. Um, so the thousand CFM is the equipment we selected. So we decided um, at some point that this was gonna be a two and a half ton system. And I'm gonna just be, no, you know, just be typical and design it to 400 CFM per ton. I would actually try to be better than that. 400 CFM per ton is a pretty generic number. If just for examples is what a lot of people use. I recommend that you go higher if possible, uh, but let's just keep it simple and do 400 CFM per ton. So two and a half times 400 is last time I checked, a thousand CFM. And um, let's see. So we told the software that that's how much air we want to move. And it's going to take that thousand CFM and it's going to distribute it proportional to each room's load. Okay. Um, so again, two and a half ton at 400 CFM, and we're just gonna say it half inches of water column. And I'll explain that, that that's called the total external static pressure, half inches of water column. That comes from a table for that air handler. The air handler is gonna have a table that says it'll move this much CFM at this pressure, this much CFM at this pressure, this much CFM at this pressure. It just so happens that for most furnaces, half inch static pressure results in around 400 CFM per ton, okay? So those are very common numbers used uh, when you're doing a generic design and you don't know the actual equipment. Uh, they're very common numbers used for examples, like what I'm doing right now is just an example. But in reality, you're gonna use the actual numbers. So you might use 0.6 and you might use a different CFM per ton. Like I said, I try to go higher when I can. Okay, it depends on the equipment that I'm using. All right. So where did the come from? We got a thousand CFM and you can see that the bedroom needs, master bedroom needs 217. The master bath needs 64. The bath two needs 47. Where in the world do those numbers come from? Again, it's all about percentages. It's all about ratios. It's all about proportionality. Okay. So if this room happened to be 10% of the total, then this would be 10% of that. Well, it's not. What is it? Well, that's what this column right here is for. Cooling fraction. Cooling fraction is just telling you what percent or what fraction this load is of the total. And then it takes that number and it multiplies it times 1,000 to give you the CFM. So this room, 4411, is 0.217 or 21.7% of the load. Therefore, we need 21.7% of the airflow. Well, 0.217 times 1,000 is 217. There, that's why I love two and a half ton systems because the math is easy. All right, 1,000 CFM. All right, so it's all about percentages. So room airflow is proportional to room load. So you need the room load first, and then you calculate your cooling fraction, and then you multiply that times the total CFM, and you get it. All right, so the cooling fraction represents the fraction or percent. You just move the decimal over two places to get the percent. Um, that the total room load, that room load is of the total. So 4411 divided by 220289 is 0.217, 21.7%. Multiply that times 1,000, 0.217 times 1,000 give you 217. So there you go. Don't worry about little small round off errors, just round it to the nearest CFM, that's fine. Um, so each room cooling fraction multiplying times the CFM then gives you the target for each room. And those should all add up to a thousand, just the way the math works out. If it's off by a few CFM, that's probably because of round off error. Don't worry about that. All right. I call this each room's fair share of the air. All right. Fair share of the air. And that means it's getting the amount of air that it needs because it has a certain load associated with that room. So it's the fair share of air. If you don't do room by room load calculations, you are totally guessing, all right? If you, if you didn't know these numbers, if all you knew was 1,000 CFM and you didn't know the load of each room, how would, how would you distribute air to these rooms? You would, you would look at it and you say, okay, master bedroom, oh, that probably gets an eight inch duct. Master bath, let's give that a six. Bath, let's give that a four. Bedroom, uh, let's give that a seven or eight, maybe a six if it's, a, you know, and you're, you're just guessing, you have no idea. Um, Let's see, bedroom, I was trying to find, there's two similar rooms um, on different parts of the house that have pretty different loads. 
because they're pointed in different directions. Actually, it's not this, it's a, a different example house. Um, so having these room by your load counts is super, super important. And that's how we know how much air to get to each room. And then when I'm out in the field fighting for where my ducks get to go, this is what I'm thinking about. If they say, hey, you can't run an eight inch duck through here. And then I'm like, heck, I, I gotta get, I gotta get 129 CFM to the dining room. Uh, I gotta get it there however I can get it there. If I can't get it there with two eight inch ducks, I'm gonna run two six inch ducks if I have to. Um, so I'm, I'm always just, that's what I'm shooting for is to make sure I'm getting this airflow to the room and making sure I have at least a thousand CFM total airflow. Okay, because as soon as that thousand CFM starts getting pinched off, then you start seeing problems with balance. All right, very useful information, very easy to determine because we did a room variable load calculation. So the same process on the heating side, exact same thing. It's just that you're going to have a different load, you're going to have different percentages. They'll be they'll be close, and you're going to have a different total CFM. Okay, now it's fairly common for heat pumps to run um, heating and cooling mode on the same CFM on both on the high speed. Um, it just depends. It depends on how much heating you need and how much cooling you need. Okay, you might run heating on high and cooling on medium high or something like that. Um, but it, it, the point is, is you, you gotta figure out that's a manual S issue. And then once you determine your air flows, then this will help you determine your duct size, right? The heating CFM is compared to the cooling CFM. Ducts should be sized to the higher of the two. I already mentioned that. And that's what, um, that's what you use, okay? Now, you saw how we laid out this duct system. We have branches and we have trunks. So let's size the branches first. That's the easy part. So we know that we need to get the last run going to the master bedroom has to deliver 217 CFM of air, okay? The last one going to the master bath has to be 64 CFM of air, all right? So now let's size those first. Let's size the runs the ducts that are connected to the registers because we know right now how much air is going through those. It's these numbers right here. Okay, the size of ducts, we need to know the airflow, which we got, and now we need another number. This is the most complicated part of manual D right here. It's called the friction rate, the friction rate. It's a really non-intuitive number. I, I really don't like the name. I wish it was called something else. I prefer calling it available friction instead of calling it the friction rate. I would like to change the name to available friction, but that's just me. <laughs> Nobody's listening to me. Um, um, actually, I, I, I've convinced a lot of pretty high up people at ACA that, that available friction is a better name, but it's been around too long. Um, and every single duculator you find is gonna say friction rate on it, okay? Or friction, friction loss is another word, okay? Um, it's a really complicated topic. Um, I'll do my best to explain it to you here, but if I don't do a good job explaining it, if it's still kind of, uh, or later on, if you need a, a refresher, uh, go to my blog article, my blog, my blog, and search for friction rate, okay? All right, so it's a number used to size ducts, and it's based on that starting static pressure, remember that 0.5 inch static pressure that I said could be 0 0.6, 0 0.5, you go to a table for the air handler, and it says the air handler will give you this much air at this pressure. That's the first number we use, okay? And then there's some pressure losses. That's what you start with. And then there's things that eat up that pressure right off the bat, like your coil, filters, other stuff, eat that stuff up. Then you're left with what's called the available static pressure. And then another important number is total equivalent lengths. That's a very, very clever way of quantifying resistance through a fitting or through a duct by equating it to length of straight duct. So in other words, well, I actually have a slide for this. I'll get to that in a second. Just, just, just realize that the equation for friction rate starts with your total static pressure. You lose some things right off the bat from some, some apply, um, uh, accessories and your coil and stuff like that. And then what you're left with is called available static pressure. That's how much pressure will actually push the air through the ducts. That's how much pressure is left to actually push the air through the ducts. Okay, we call that available static pressure. And then um, equivalent lengths. So it's the number used on a duct slide rule. Okay, so I got, I got my collection of duct slide rules here. I've got my quiet flex. I got my uh, 
Coleman metal, Lennox metal. I got my Atco Flex uh, train metal. And then the one I like the best is, is the Akawin because it's a wheel and it's, it's much more precise. And it has three different types of ducts on it. It's got uh, metal duct, flex duct, and duct liner. So whichever one you use, it's gonna ask you for two things. Once you know the type of duct, it's gonna ask you for two things. It's gonna ask you for uh, airflow and friction rate, friction rate, friction loss, okay? And you get those lined up and then it's gonna tell you the duct size, all right? So um, that's why friction rate is important. What is friction rate? Well, friction rate is saying you're, you've got so much resistance in your duct, either because there's a lot of fittings, a lot of turns, or it's a really long duct, compared to a shorter duct run, this one has a lot more friction, okay? And, but you gotta move the same amount of air through those. How do we, how do we know whether it's gonna be a different size duct for 100 CFM going three feet versus 100 CFM going 200 feet, okay? We look at the friction rate. The friction rate says, oh, you're gonna lose a certain amount of friction by the time you get to the end. Therefore, you're gonna need a bigger duct to do that. And over here, you're gonna need a smaller duct. That's what friction rate tells you. So the equation for friction rate is available static pressure, that's your total starting static pressure minus those accessories and things, times 100 divided by total equivalent length, okay? So equivalent lengths, like I said, is a very clever way of equating friction drop or pressure drop through a fitting by equating it to length and saying this fitting has a resistance that's equal to the resistance of 10 feet of straight duct or 20 feet of straight duct or 60 feet of straight duct um, because it has a lot more resistance. And there's a, there's manual D has some um, appendices and it's got all these different kinds of fittings in it. So like here, remember I said on the TY, uh, you've got air that's going straight through it and, and you also have air coming off at an angle. Well, it just so happens that the air going straight to the TY has a, a pressure drop equal to five feet of straight duct. So that's its equivalent length. The air that's being pulled off at an angle because it has to make that turn, okay, and it, there's probably a reduction there too, has an equivalent length of 25 feet of straight duct. That's substantial, okay? So 25 versus five, the air going straight has five, the air coming off is 25. If you have a bunch of, uh, every time the air goes off, it goes off to the side, those, at, those 25 feet add up, plus the actual length of the duct, plus the equivalent length of all the other fittings. So even though you have a 30 foot run, the equivalent length when you take into account all the fittings makes it more like a 200 foot run. And that might make the duct bigger, okay? So that's how, that's how the friction rate takes all that into account. Now, back in the old days, what we would do is um, we, would, we would figure out which was the worst case run. We would look at our layout and we'd say, okay, this run is gonna have the most equivalent lengths. And we would use that friction rate to size all the ducts. And that's because that was before software. That was back when we were using a calculator and, and a pencil and, and doing all this stuff by hand. Now that, we have, now that we have computers that do all this stuff for us, I highly, highly recommend that you do a friction rate for each individual run it has its own friction rate. And you can do that really easily with the software, but all the software, um, have a little checkbox in them that's required by manual D that allows you to check the box and say, use worst case. And I have seen that cause issues. You could have a really, really long run for hundred feet and a really, really, or sorry, a really, really long run for hundred CFM and a really short run that also needs hundred CFM. If you use the worst case uh, friction rate, it's gonna make those the same size, which will be for the long run. And now the short run is going to get way too much air because it's, it's using a friction rate for a much longer run and it's, it's a bigger duct than it needs to be. Okay. So I recommend that you use uh, custom friction rates. All right. Um, let's see. The resistance created by a simple 90 degree bend can have the same resistance as between 15 and 30 feet of straight duct, depending on the velocity. So now velocity comes into play too, which makes it a little a little more complicated, but the software, the software does this pretty much for you, okay? Uh, the resistance of airflow created by TY, I already mentioned this. Um, that one example showed five. Um, there's another one that shows the straight inch, uh, the straight uh, air going through is 10 um, and 25 coming off to the side. 
it, it depends on which table you look at, stuff like that, and the velocities. Um, so there you go. Mentioned that already. So you add those all up. You start, you actually start at the return grill and you add up the equivalent lengths and the actual lengths of each duct and you go all the way out to the supply register and you add those up and that's your total equivalent length. It's all your ducts and all your fittings. Okay, registers, coil, filter, those are all handled previously when we subtracted those from the total external static pressure. Now we're looking at the lengths that the air has to, has to travel uh, through things that are be sized for that airflow, okay? And that's the number that goes here. Again, the software does this for you. Uh, very long runs with a lot of fittings will have very high TELs, which will result in lower friction rates, which will result in bigger ducts. That's what I was saying that the friction rate is not an intuitive number. Um, you would think high friction rate would mean small ducts. No, it's low friction rate means, uh, so high friction rate does mean small. It's available friction rate. How much friction do you have available to you? Okay, so um, high equivalent lengths, oh, will result in lower friction rate, which will result in bigger ducts, okay? And you can always just look at this equation and say, well, if I add, if I add length, that's in the bottom of the equation, so that number is gonna get smaller. If I add pressure or, that's gonna make the number bigger. If I lose pressure, that's gonna make the number bigger, right? So, so it, you just all kind of look at that and just, you can see, you can also kind of play around with your duct rule. Even though I use, um, even though I use software, I still have a duct slide rule handy. because so I like to say, okay, um, how many equivalent lengths do I have to get rid of to, to change that duct size? Or how many equivalent lengths can I add before I have to go get bigger on the duct size? And it's really easy to do with a, with a ductulator in your hand. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see, do, 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 do. friction rate represents how much static pressure can be used up. Lower friction rate equals bigger ducts, okay? If you have less friction you can spend, you're gonna have to have bigger ducts to do that. Friction rate is lower for longer runs than it is for shorter runs. Um, really common friction rates that you should sort of, I don't wanna say shoot for, but if you did if you did a thousand designs and you kind of average them all out, all the friction rates, they would be between 0.09 and 0.11. If you look at a um, manual D um, table, uh, it'll show um, a maximum and minimum as a little graph showing maximum and minimum friction rate. It just so happens that the average is about 0.1. It's also, I bet I can find it on here. <clears throat> if you look at a um, this one have it? No, I think this one has it. This one will say, start at 0.1 friction rate. Start at 0.1 friction rate. So a lot of duct ductulators, the 0.1 is highlighted somehow. It'll have a little arrow on it or something like that. So that's kind of a, if you don't know any better sort of thing, um, 0.1 is a, is a very common friction rate for a typical duct system. The really long runs will have lower friction rates. The really short runs will have higher friction rates, but they'll average out about, to about 0.1. So when I do a design, I'm kind of looking for around between 0.08 and 0.12, something like that, in that range. Manual D suggests that you don't have less than 0.06 or greater than 0.18, okay? I can sure I have a slide for that. Okay, again, for a more detailed explanation, I go into a lot of detail, uh, go to my blog and search for friction rate, okay? Um, so this table is a screen snip out of the software. This is very common to something called the ACA Manual D Friction Rate Worksheet. It's laid out exactly the same. Uh, I, I should have a copy printed out somewhere. Well, here's my Manual D. And if I just scroll through Manual D until I find this sample problem, the, here's, this is a Manual D Worksheet. That what you're seeing on the on the screen right now is is laid out exactly like that, and this is that little diagram I was telling you, that little graph, okay, that has the maximum and minimum, and if we average those out, they they're it's about 0.1, okay. So this should look familiar if you've done a bunch of manual Ds. This this layout that you're looking at right here should look familiar, and you've got your ESP or external static pressure and your CFM. That's what comes from the manufacturer's blower data. We looked that up in a table. Now these are generic numbers, okay? The, if you're doing an actual equipment, you're gonna say 0.5 at 1097 or 1152, or you know, there's gonna be different 
more precise numbers up here. These are generic numbers. I'm just using as an example. And this example is a furnace, okay? I need to change this to be a heat pump one of these days. Um, so the first thing that's gonna, you're gonna lose static pressure is your coil. You're starting with 0.5, and the first thing that eats up your pressure as the air comes out of that air handler is um, the coil. And it loses a lot. Almost half of your pressure is lost through your coil. Now, if this was a fan coil unit, all you really do is you take this number here and you subtract it from up here. So on a fan coil unit, you're gonna have a lower starting ESP, like 0 0.25, 0 0.3, something like that. But then you don't have this loss because the coil's inside the box already. All right, so anyways. Um, then you, use, you lose something from your filter. I like to design to 0.1 or less. And then your supply outlet and return grills have a pressure drop. These are very common numbers. These are defaulted for manual D. Um, you don't have to use these numbers, but these are very common numbers to use. But what this is saying is, and what this filter is saying is, when I choose a filter, when I size a filter, I wanna make sure that it's not any more of a pressure drop than 0.09 for the filter and 0.03 for the grills. So that's where manual T comes into play. It's terminal selection. How do you pick a register so that it will move the right amount of airflow and not have a static pressure drop more than 0.03. Okay, so we're basically saying, I wanna move a thousand CFM of air. That's the most important thing right off the bat. I wanna move a thousand CFM of air. My air handler will move that thousand CFM as long as it's experiencing no more than 0.5 external static pressure. So I wanna make sure when I design my system, it's not gonna have more static pressure because higher pressure means less airflow. The, the air the fans working harder to move the air so it's less airflow so how do i do that is i i size my filter to what i'm trying to do i size my grills to what i'm trying to do and i make sure my coil oh i forgot to mention this is a number you look up from the coil manufacturer so you you go to this coil manufacturer and you say what size i'm got a two and a half ton heat pump uh two and a half ton coil moving a thousand cfm is going to have a static pressure drop of 0.3 i go ooh, that's high what if we bumped it up to a, a three ton coil? We have a two and a half ton um, condenser. You can put a three ton coil on there, no problem. And you go look at that three ton coil and you go, ah, it only has a pressure drop of 0.21 instead of 0.3. That's a way to improve airflow is to put a bigger coil on there. That's a very common thing to do, okay? And it, it improves other things as well. So you'll see that. I did that quite a bit. Almost every, System I designed that was in a half ton increments, like one and a half, two and a half, three and a half tons. I always rounded up a size on the coil. I always went to the full uh, two, three, and four ton coils. Okay, um, let's see. Another way to size ducts is to use a ductulator. So here's a couple ductulators. Um, make sure you use the right, uh, that you look at your ductulator and it's for the appropriate size duct. I can't tell you how many contractors I've run into who use a metal ductulator to size flex duct. And then they complain about it. Yeah, it's not moving as much air. I hate flex duct. It's, it'll give you a different size. Remember I said one size difference. So if you're using a metal ductulator and you get a size and then use that to size flex duct, it's gonna be like having one size too small for your flex duct, okay? And I've seen that happen a lot, unfortunately. So make sure you use the right type and you got to look at it really closely. And I, I actually write on mine, I write metal with a Sharpie. I write metal on mine. You say metal, metal with an exclamation point. And these are flex, okay? And then on the, on the, the, the ACA wheel, you just have to make sure you use the right, the right one for uh, metal, flex, and duct liner. Yeah, what duck board is four different. Oh, they're the same. Duck board and duck liner is the same. Okay. All right. So what I did is I took my ductulator and a friction rate of 0.1, and I went to each size duct that's commonly available. So four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then at ten they go in two inch increments. All right. And some people say, well, I don't use odd size ducts. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. But this is very common duct sizes that you can get. And I used a friction rate of 0.1, and I said, okay, how much air will this four inch duct give me at a friction rate of 0.1? And the answer is 20. How much will a five inch do? 50. How much will a six inch do? 80, and so forth. And I just created this little table, okay? 
And then I actually, I call this the world's smallest duculator. This is the back of my business card. And it has a table just like this, but I do it for uh, 0.11 friction rate, 0.1, 0.09, and 0.08. So I have four columns. And you can see how the airflow changes at different friction rates, okay? I can actually design a duct system using my business card, okay? It's a little mini tiny ductulator. Um, so um, all this is saying is this is what a four inch will give you at a friction rate of 0.1. So if your friction rate is different, this airflow is gonna be different, but not by a huge amount, okay? So you can actually use this table to size ducts. So you say, I need to get 89 CFM to a room. At a friction rate of 0.1, I need to get 89 CFM. Well, how big of a duct do I need? Well, 89, let's see. Well, a six inch duct will give me 80. So that's not gonna cut it. I need a bigger duct. So I need to go up one size. So I need a seven inch duct, okay? So to get 89 CFM, I need a seven inch duct because a six inch duct won't do it. Now that's interesting because we only need set 89, but a seven will handle 120. That's one of the beauties of manual D is it rounds up a duct size and you've got some excess capacity. Okay, so when you use manual D and I've, I've, I have field tests to prove this, um, I was hoping for a thousand CFM We'd go out and we'd measure it, and I would always get better than what I wanted, which was good. That's what you want. And the reason is manual D rounds up a size. So if you needed, if you needed 81 CFM to get to a room, if you needed 81 CFM, the software, well, actually, there is a little leeway in there. Let's say if you needed 85 CFM, okay? If you needed 85 CFM, it, the software will say, nope, you need a seven-inch duct. A six-inch isn't going to cut it, okay? Um, so, so there you go. So that's a, that's a safety margin, if you will. That's a safety margin built into manual D. Um, here's another interesting thing. Look at the difference between a six inch duct and the next size up, which is a seven inch duct. The difference between a six inch duct and a seven inch duct is a 50% increase in airflow. That's fascinating to me. A six inch duct will give you 80 and a seven inch duct will give you 120. That's a big difference. So what that's saying is, if you round up a size, you're probably really good, but if you round down a size, you could be really causing an issue. So by rounding up a size, you get a 50% increase in airflow by going up one size, and it's similar throughout these other ones, okay? But if you go down a size, you reduce the airflow by 30%, by 33%. Okay, so that's why when I when I go out to a house and I said, look, man, I called for a seven inch duct to this room and they go, oh, we don't use odd size ducts. So we rounded down to a six inch duct. Well, I needed 110 CFM. And they put in a duct that only gave me 80. That's going to be an issue. Okay, that's going to be a problem. That's why I was very strict about duct sizes, because rounding down a size really chokes off a lot. Same thing on a return. All of your air is going through very few ducts on the return side. If you round those down, okay. How many times have you seen a, a 20 inch return duct on a five ton system? I see it all the time. I've seen 18 inch return ducts on a five ton system, just an 18 inch return duct on a five ton system. A 20 inch duct won't even give you 2000 CFM. A 20 inch flex duct is not even rated for 2000 CFM. So there's no way a 20 inch return duct is adequate for a 510 system. Okay, so these are very, very important. All right, uh, what happens if the duct is too big? Ah, great question. So what happens, oh, somebody's microphone is turned on, I think. I think someone needs to, I'm getting some background noise. Um, that's it, thank you. Um, so if a duct is too big, um, you're going to get more air, which is not a bad thing in a dry climate. Now, if we were in, Florida or Mississippi or Louisiana, it's a different issue, okay? If you're in a really, really humid climate, uh, you do have to be careful with, with um, too much airflow. Uh, but in a dry climate, more airflow is good. So if you make one duct too big, you're gonna get excess air in that room and you might throw off the balance, okay? If you make all the ducts big, um, you're gonna get more airflow, which is a good thing, all right? But um, uh, let me just put it this way. You cannot oversize a return duct. You cannot oversize a return duct, okay? 
Um, that's I've, I, I've yet to find an issue where you can go oversize return duct. Now to a point, to a point, okay? Um, the best return duct on a system is no return duct at all, okay? So you have no resistance on the return side. That's fine too. Um, and sorry, I'm getting background. It looks like uh, Jawan, Mr. Singh, um, your microphone is on. I'm, sounds like you're coming bumping it around. Yes, there you go. Thank you. I um, I'll keep muting uh, as needed. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, if you need to answer a question, um, raise your hand or, or type it into the chat. Okay. Um, all right. So oversizing. Now the downside. There is a downside to oversizing ducts, but it has nothing to do with air. It's not a bad thing for airflow. It's not a bad thing for comfort. What happens is when you downsize the duct or when you when a duct is too, quote unquote, too big, the surface area gets bigger and you have more heat transfer to it. So you might you might get more heat gain in the summer and heat loss in the winter. So it's an energy issue. Surface area affects heat transfer. So bigger ducts have more surface area. But in terms of airflow, it's usually not a problem. Now, if you had a one and a half ton system moving, you know, 600 CFM, you don't want to run 20 inch ducts to every room. That's kind of ridiculous. There's just not enough pressure to move the air through, through that. So I would say within a size or two, there's no problem going bigger. Okay. I do know people who, who, who take velocity very seriously when they size their ducts and that's mostly an energy issue. Okay. They're trying to be as conservative on saving energy as possible. But from a comfort issue, generally speaking, um, oversizing ducts is not an issue, not a problem. And neither is low velocity. Okay. All right. I'm kind of getting on my soapbox and I'm, I'm afraid I'm running out of time here. So I'm going to speed up here. So again, odd size ducts. Um, there are some supply houses that don't carry odd size ducts. Just round up. For goodness sakes, don't round down. Round up. Okay. Simple. Okay. Um, so here we got our airflow and our friction rate, and there's a built-in ductulator in the software, and it's going to say for 109 CFM at 0.1, seven-inch duct. There you go. Again, if you don't like odd-sized ducts, round up a size. So these turn all these sevens to eights and all these five to sixes, and you'll be good to go. Um, pretty simple. So that's all the supply branches. That's the ducts going to the register. What if you have a trunk? and it's serving two supply branches. How do you know how big to make that trunk? Simple, add them up. How much air is going to this one? How much air is going to that one? Add that together, size the trunk to handle that much airflow. Very simple. So here we have a trunk. This one's actually serving three registers. So we have to do this trunk first. So we know how much air is going to this register. We know how much air is going to this register. We add those together to size this trunk. And then we add that airflow in that trunk to the airflow in this branch to size this trunk. Simple. The software does it for you automatically, but it's good to know what's going on there. Okay, so just add up the downstream branches. So we got 47, 98, add that together. So we know that this duct needs to handle at least 145 CFM. So we use our little ductulator or the built-in ductulator and it'll tell you what size duct that needs to be. I think that's an eight. Okay, same thing on return ducts. Now, return ducts are a little different. If you have multiple returns, you have to decide which rooms are going to be served by that return. And it's fairly arbitrary. Air, air is not going to go to that return just because you say it's going to go to that return. You just want to make sure that both returns are sized to handle all of the airflow. The exception to that is if you have a return on, on one side of a door, of a closable door, you want to assign everything on that side of the door to that return. And that's what I typically do for a master suite. So this master suite back here has a big walk-in closet and a big bathroom in this bedroom back here. And I gave it its own return. And so, and that returns on the other side of the door going to the master suite. So I'm gonna assign all three of those rooms, the bathroom, the walk-in closet, and the big bedroom. I'm gonna assign those rooms to that return. That's why I put that return in there. Because if I didn't, all that air has to come out through the door. And then you start closing doors. Um, that's a whole nother issue, by the way. Remember, I mentioned the, 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 the project where I put a return in every bedroom. Somebody goes, oh, you need a return in every bedroom because when the door is closed, the air will have no place to go. Well, the air will go into the door to a point, okay? But there's also other ways to accomplish that 
more cheaply, just as effectively, without actually putting a return in that bedroom. Okay, uh, and I have a I have a blog article on that. So if you're curious about that, go to my blog and search for pressure pressure, and it's called pressure relief. And it's you blowing air into a room that's got a closed door. That air needs to get back to the return. How's it going to get back? Then go under the door and go through a return grill. There's jumper ducts is a, another way to do it. So there's a lot of different ways to handle that. Okay. Um, so you just figure out which supply registers are going to go to which return and you just assign those. And then it'll size that duct accordingly. You just want to make sure all the rooms are and all the registers are assigned to at least one return. Uh, I mentioned all this already. If it's behind a closable door, assign all those rooms to that one. And this is what the big final duct table looks like. Once you've done all that, once you've assigned rooms to returns, once you've sized all your, uh, the software does it for you automatically, okay? Um, then um, here's what it looks like. So you've got all your supply branches. There was, I had to put, I ended up having to put two in the master bedroom. If I only had one, it was like a 10 inch duct. That's, I don't like putting a 10 inch duct to a, a register. Um, that's a little too big. Uh, it can get noisy and other stuff. So I split it into two sevens. Okay, maybe it was just a nine. Um, but anyways, so here's all the supply branches. Here's all the supply trunks. And here's all the return branches. There's no return trunks. All the return branches were, were connected directly to the thing. Remember I was talking about the home run system where you, you have the supply plenum and you go straight to the register. Every single register has a home run on it. If you did that, guess what? No trunks. <laughs> There's no trunks and no TYs either. So that's why some people do that is it's actually, it can be cheaper in terms of parts um, and, and design. Okay. So no trunks if you did that. So here's all the trunks. Here's the supply branches. Here's all the airflow for everything. Here's all the friction rates. You see they you have as low as 0.06 and as high as 0.11. Okay. So the 0.06 is going to be a really long run and the 0.11 is going to be a really short run with less fittings. Here's the diameters. Here's the length, velocities, register sizes. You can type those in if you want to. When you pick a register, you wanna make sure you pick a register that has a friction drop no more than the 0.03 that you assumed when you did your friction rate calculation. That's manual T. And this just shows you that um, supply branch 0.1.1 by supply train, trunk two, okay, and so on and so forth. There's, this shows that um, which bedroom um, is serving which register. So you can see that some are serving, re, or sorry, which return grill. Some are serving return branch two and some are served by return branch one. So it's all in there based on how you drew it because of how you drew it, the software knows which trunks serve which branches and all that other stuff. You do have to assign the rooms to the return. And that's what you do that right here. Actually, you click on this little down arrow and it'll give you the choice of returns to assign to that branch. And then here's all the type, this is all flex, okay? Even though the fittings are sheet metal, it's still considered a flex duct system. All right, there you go. This is what the final design should look like. You can barely see the numbers. I should have made those a little bigger, um, but I'll zoom in on it. What you want is a reasonably accurate layout because if, you, like, if you're an engineer and you're handing this to somebody else to install, you're not installing it yourself, you need to communicate your, your intent as good as possible, as, as, as well as possible. And um, the other thing that's really important that I like to do, I think is very important, is show the target CFM at each register. Show how much air you want to come out of that register. And then I was really lucky and when I ran the mechanical engineering departments, we actually had field HERS raters who would go out and measure them. After they got installed, they would measure them. And if they saw a problem, they would let me know. And then I could call the builder and say, hey, make sure they're following my plans. Or actually, I'd tell the HERS rater, if you measure really low airflow, make sure they followed the plans. Make sure they didn't round down a duct size. A lot of times they did, and they would have to fix it. Or they would say, oh, there was a kink in the duct or something like that. But that was amazingly valuable feedback to me. That's why I have so much confidence in my designs is that all, not all, the vast majority of the designs I did got tested after they got installed, okay? And, and that's why there's so few, very, almost no, no serious complaints, okay? 
uh, and all those thousands of designs built dozens of times each. Um, compare this to that, this feedback is, is critical. That If you're doing designs and you're installing them yourself, please, please, please measure. Measure the airflow at each register, measure the total airflow, measure the static pressure across the air, air handler. That's just, that's just the best feedback you can possibly get, okay? Um, if you don't get that feedback, it's like, it's like shooting a bow and arrow with, with, with blinders on. You don't know what your target, you don't know if you hit the target or not, okay? You've got to know if you hit the target in order to do a better job the second time. Okay, let's wrap this up. Where things can go wrong, you can have incomplete information or bad assumptions about the house, all right? You thought it had, or they told you it had dual pane windows, but it really had single pane windows. That's not really your fault, okay? Go out to the house, check it. Um, the house was not built the way you were told. I've had that happen a lot. Um, and it's usually, a, it's usually a major screw up. I had houses where um, they didn't insulate over the bedrooms. They, they put no ceiling insulation over the bedrooms. They go, ah, oh, the bedrooms are too hot. We go out there and look and there's no ceiling insulation over the bedrooms. Well, that's not the, that's not the HVAC problem. Uh, equipment is undersized, equipment is oversized. Those are very, especially oversizing will cause a lot of issues. Low system airflow, those can be, if you do a good design, those go away. Target rooms are incorrect. Supply register types and locations, thermostat location. I didn't get a chance to talk about thermostat location, but that can have a that can have an impact too. Uh, you want the thermostat, I'll just say this, you want the thermostat close to the return, okay? Uh, and, it, and, and there's obvious places like not on an exterior wall, not where the sun is gonna shine on it, not, not where register is blowing directly on it, stuff like that. Um, occupant behavior and expectations. Most people say there's nothing you can do about that. Actually, there is. It's called education. Um, and that may or may not help, but um, yeah, it helps. It does help. So become proficient and confident with the software. Practice, practice, practice. Double check your work. Join users group. There's some great, uh, I'm on like eight Facebook groups for HVAC design. And share your designs with other. Ask for feedback. Say, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think for, about that? Do not do a design in a vacuum. Don't sit in your cubicle and do a design and not have anybody review it and comment on it. You've got to share it. You've got to, you've got to learn from other people, okay? Test your designs after they are installed. I can't emphasize how valuable that is. I can't emphasize that enough. Educate homeowners on the proper system operation. Tell them to set the thermostat and don't touch the damn thing, okay? Don't let them use the thermostat like the thermostat in their car. That's not how manual J, S, and D, which is required by code, that's not how manual J, S, and D is designing the house to be operated. If they want to operate the thermostat like the car, then to get a different client would be my, would be my uh, suggestion. Um, but no, you have to educate them and say, look, you'll be more comfortable. Just set it, leave it alone and let the thing do its job, okay? Um, air towards smaller equipment and larger ducts. If you're right on the borderline, you say, gosh, should I go bigger on the equipment or smaller on the ducts? Go, go, go bigger on the ducts, smaller on the equipment, if possible, okay? Always air to that side. All right, that is it. Great, if you wanna close it out for us. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you so much for us, that was great. And uh, thanks for the business card idea. That was, that was very <laughs> smart, I appreciate that. Um, so if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to Russ or you can reach me at my email address um, listed here. Uh, I will be sending the slides, recording um, and survey um, probably tomorrow, if not this afternoon for both classes. Um, and then feel free to check out any of our upcoming courses at 3cren.org uh, backslash events. Um, thank you all very much. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Uh, there's a question. If you want to email me that question, I'll be happy to, to go into that about setting back thermos.